Good morning, everyone. I am Erica Pothig. I'm an Institute Fellow and Director of Urban Policy Initiatives at the Urban Institute, and I'm so pleased to welcome you here this morning. Um, this is a really important conversation we're going to have this morning on the cost of economic and racial segregation. We learned through our research that the costs of racial and economic segregation add up to lost income, lost lives, and lost potential. Today, we're going to dig into those findings that measure the impact of segregation in 100 metropolitan regions across the country, but also dive deeper into the impact in Chicago. We have a fabulous crowd here in the room, but I also want to welcome our online audience who are tuned in from across the country for this conversation. I encourage everyone today to continue the dialogue by sharing your thoughts or observations on social media. Uh, please use the hashtag live at urban, which is up here, so you won't forget it. Uh, if you would, please include the, speak, uh, the speaker's Twitter handles, which should be on your agenda uh, and available to you. Um, and if you're tuning in via the webcast, you may submit your questions to events at urban.org at any time during the program, and someone will filter those to the moderator. So again, that's events at urban.org. So local, state, and federal policy have created the pernicious structures of segregation in American society. Pernicious because even though we have overturned Jim Crow laws and separate but equal schools and upheld the Fair Housing Act, spatial segregation by income, race, and ethnicity still persists in most of our cities. The hidden and explicit structures of racism in America have proven extremely difficult to dismantle. There are many people who have told the story of racism in the United States, but Tanahishi Coates' elaboration on the legacy of redlining, undergirded by the policies of the Federal Housing Administration and white realtors profiting from housing market discrimination in Chicago, is perhaps one of the most powerful. It is a damning critique of the history of white racism in Chicago, a place even Martin Luther King Jr. once said, white hatred was worse than in Mississippi. I am a Chicagoan, so I blanch at these critiques. They sting because there is truth in the lived experiences of people of color and borne out by data and evidence. Creating a more inclusive city is not only Chicago's challenge and imperative, but an imperative that many American cities need to confront and embrace. More than a year ago, our partner, the Metropolitan Planning Council, which is a venerable civic organization in Chicago, founded more than 80 years ago to promote better planning and housing, came to us with a research question. By asking and exploring the research question, what are the costs of economic and racial segregation to whites, to people of color, and to the broader society? We hope to not only reframe the conversation around economic and racial segregation in Chicago, but to also unlock some new policy approaches to dismantling segregation and disinvestment. Two other venerable Chicago institutions, the MacArthur Foundation and the Chicago Community Trust, not only financially supported the research, but they have been critical partners along every step of the way. It has been a true partnership, and we at Urban have been honored to contribute our research insights to the effort. Today's event will provide a brief overview of the findings of the cost of segregation study. Ralph Pendel will provide a brief overview of the national findings of the cost of segregation study, and Marisa Novara We'll follow Rolf, Maurice is from the Metropolitan Planning Council, offering um, the impetus for the study and the local perspective uh, around uh, both the insights but also uh, what uh, the Metropolitan Planning Council and partners in Chicago um, are going to be doing with this set of insights and analysis. We're going to move to our expert panel to further delve into the insights.
but also talk about the future, not only in Chicago, but around the country that are in the cities that are also facing these same patterns of economic and racial segregation. I'd now like uh, to welcome Ralph Pendle, who's the co-director of the Metropolitan Housing and Community Policy Center here at Urban Institute. He has been one of the leaders of this study, along with Greg Och, who leads our Income Benefits Policy Center, um, and others here at Urban who've really contributed and led on these research insights. He is going to give an overview of the national findings. Um, thank you so much for coming online and in the room today for this important conversation. Thank you, Ralph. Well, thank you, Erica, and thank you, everyone in the room and uh, out there uh, in the ether who is uh, joining us today. Um, it's been a great pleasure to work on this project with um, Marisa and her team uh, at the MPC. Uh, I want to acknowledge before I begin, again, Greg Och, who's the lead author on the paper, whose results I'll be uh, presenting in just a second as well as Mark Trescon, uh, my colleague at the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center, and Amy Carre, who is a consultant to, uh, to MPC in Chicago. Uh, we all work together on the paper that is available online by Googling Urban Institute, uh, Cost of Segregation, you'll find all of it there. Erica's already previewed this, but I wanna underscore that the country that we live in today is a country in which apartheid was constructed deliberately over decades and even centuries uh, by government policy, by individual actions, uh, by private sector organizations. Uh, and this is uh, something of the map that you see with the blue dots being representing white, green representing African American, uh, or black, uh, orange representing Latino, and red representing Asian households uh, or persons. Each of the dots on these maps represents one person. So at the macro scale, at the scale of the whole United States, you can see legacies of slavery uh, in the black belt. Uh, if you zoom in to a city like Atlanta, you can see the color line from north to south that, that Atlanta still has today, many decades after the agreements that said, that's your side and this is our side. And in neighborhoods like New York City, where decades, uh, many decades of sorting out within a dense, high competition city uh, and also disinvestment in some neighborhoods uh, and over-concentration of public and affordable housing uh, in, in other neighborhoods have led to the racial patchwork that we have now. We did this on purpose. Since 1969, also, the United States has seen increasing levels of income inequality nationally within metropolitan areas uh, and in cities. And those income divisions have played out in space between 1990 and 2010 alone, the average income of the top 10% of neighborhoods in each of these 100 biggest metropolitan areas grew from 4.4 times to 5.7 times higher than the bottom 10% of neighborhoods just in 20 years. That is, the rich are getting much richer and the neighborhoods they live in are concomitantly also richer in most metropolitan areas. This feeds economic segregation that, that reinforces the racial segregation that we established over decades and centuries. We did this on purpose. Our laws accommodated, our laws were built to accomplish it. Uh, the fact that African Americans who are poor live predominantly in cities is not a consequence of simply their being left behind by whites who have left for the suburbs. It is a consequence of their having been shut out over, over decades uh, of, of opportunities that white non-Hispanics were offered. A lot of this has been covered. So what do we know about this? Well, we, we know that in those neighborhoods um, that are, uh, that in which low-income people and people of color are left behind, um, 
there, there are uh, lack, there's a lack of investment. The people who own land, businesses, and housing in these neighborhoods have fewer incentives than they ought to and that they should to reinvest in their communities uh, because they can't get high rents, uh, because the demand for housing and business in those neighborhoods is low, uh, and so they underinvest in their properties. And that's an underinvestment uh, that's uh, underscored and reinforced because of low tax bases with disinvestment by the public sector in these places. So you have a cycle of disinvestment in predominantly poor uh, and predominantly minority neighborhoods, mostly in cities. We know uh, that people who grow up in these neighborhoods grow up uh, to experiencing uh, lower quality in their schools, more violence in their communities, more pollution uh, in their communities and in their homes, uh, and the consequence of that over the long run is lower lifetime earnings for the people who live here. We don't know as much about what the impacts are of concentrated wealth, but we do know that that has also been growing. Um, and it is a consequence also of policy, in particular, federal tax and housing policies that concentrate almost the entire uh, U.S. budget that's spent on housing uh, in, on uh, wealthy homeowners in wealthy communities who receive tax deductions for their mortgage interest and their property taxes. We don't know what the impacts are of this on them or on society. Uh, it would be worthy of more study. These are the things that we know. So why do another study that shows the same thing? Well, we actually didn't. We asked a different kind of question, not the impacts on the individuals, but the, indivi the impacts on entire metropolitan areas of segregation by race and by income. Uh, rather than go through all the methods, I'll just show you these are the 100 largest commuting zones, which are like metropolitan, America, uh, metropolitan areas in the United States, the 100 largest in the United States. Uh, and we use statistical techniques with data from 1990, 2000, and 2010 to try to isolate the independent effect of segregation on a series of outcomes. I'm going to report the outcomes to you. If you'd like to talk about the methods with me or with the research team, Greg Och is with us today uh, also, and my colleague Mark Trescon is also available for follow-up. The first thing that we found is that segregation lowers incomes. Uh, the strongest results uh, were for the incomes of African Americans, uh, which were significantly lowered per capita incomes uh, on this graph and household incomes, which I don't show here, are significantly lowered in communities that have high levels of racial residential segregation. That's point one. What do these numbers mean? How do they add up? That would take more time than I have here. But Marisa will translate to you what these, this number and the other numbers I'll talk about here mean in Chicago in just a couple minutes. The second significant finding, which pertains to both whites and African Americans, uh, is that se uh, se uh, segregation significantly depresses college attainment for white non-Hispanics as well as for African Americans, uh, and that that's black-white segregation does, and that economic segregation further depresses the, the educational attainment of African Americans. Our third and fourth findings are that segregation between whites and Latinos reduces life expectancy for everyone in the metropolitan area. We don't have these results available broken down by race. And that segregation between African Americans and whites between blacks and whites, increases homicide rates in communities uh, that have high levels of black-white segregation. So that's a very quick overview of our findings. We built it on purpose, but let's think about the future. So many of the conversations about what we should do rely on an outmoded assumption of an either-or. Either we have to move people out of communities that are distressed to high-opportunity communities, or we have to rebuild those communities. It's time to reframe that thinking. It's backward-looking, 
It's not forward-looking. And the United States is going to grow by tens of millions of people over the next 40 to 50 years. We have an opportunity now to be just as deliberate with our efforts both to, to address the past harms through reinvestment and to create more inclusive places in the future. This is America's growth potentially just between now and 2030. That's millions of new homes, millions of new people, and lots and lots of new creativity and lots of investment that's going to happen throughout the United States. We can drive that creativity and that investment to build more inclusive places, but we have to start now. Marisa Navarro will talk to you next. She's the Vice President uh, at the Metropolitan Planning Council and our partner in this work. She'll be talking about the work that the MPC is now doing in Chicago to take on that question, how can we build a city that is inclusive so we look back in the year 2117 or our grand or great-grandchildren do and say they built this on purpose and they're proud. Thank you, Rolf, and thanks, Erica. It's also really great to see Greg Ach and Mark Trescom here. I really want to thank this incredible group of people at Urban Institute um, who showed really great passion and rigor in working through these questions with us, and maybe most importantly, incredible patience in working with a place-based organization from another part of the country in working through this process. And also thanks back in Chicago to a really great team who's worked on this, especially Amy Carre, co-author of this report, and Alden Lowry, our director of research and evaluation. Um, I, before I start, and as Rolf said, I'm going to take what, what Rolf told you about our findings overall with this project and really kind of narrow in to the, what that meant for Chicago, what those findings mean when you zero in on one geography. But before I start, I just want to say two things off the bat about segregation kind of broadly. Um, one is that it was really our, our contention going into this work that we've been talking about segregation incorrectly for a long time which is to say that we talk about segregation as if it's synonymous with low-income people of color. And you know, the Chicago region is 53% white. We have large swaths of middle and high-income people. And when we don't talk about segregation that in, in a way that includes those people in those places, then we leave a huge part of our region out of the conversation. We um, allow a large group of people to feel that segregation is not their problem and that they don't need to be part of the solution. So a big part of our interest was really in shifting that narrative going into this work. And I'll talk some about that when we get to the findings. The second thing is really more about what I'm not saying. So problematizing segregation is not the same thing as saying that integration will solve all of our problems. And I just want to be really clear about that. Um, it's not to say that if we just had a mix of incomes and races that everything would be fine. But what we are saying is that segregation matters in part because it accelerates and perpetuates inequities. It makes it easier and frankly, much more efficient to discriminate against groups of people. And we know that those groups of people have usually been people of color and those that are lower on the income scale. And that's part of why we talk about this issue. So I just want to note those two things. Uh, before jumping into some specifics about Chicago and keeping and then kind of jumping to some broader questions that um, are the study raised for us into the next phase of, of our work. So to note, um, we, went in, we came into this with two driving research questions. One is, um, what does it cost us in metropolitan Chicago to live so separately from each other by income and by race? And our report that we released in March with Urban Institute answers that first question. We're now in the phase of answering the second question, which is essentially, what do we do about it? How do we address this issue differently with the information that we gain from the answer to the first question? So I'll jump right to, um, what does segregation cost Chicago? And you'll see these themes carry across the, the, the findings that Rolf talked about, right? We found that we, um, the lost income figure means um, that we're seeing 4.4 billion in annual regional income that we're losing in the Chicago region. 
uh, lost lives. We're, we see a 30% higher rate of homicide in the Chicago region because of our rate of segregation. And lost potential, we're losing out on 83,000 more bachelor's degrees based on our level of segregation. So I'll run through each of those in a bit more detail. Lost income, so as Ralph said, um, if we reduced the level of economic and African-American white segregation in Chicago to the national median, we found that we would see almost $3,000 in additional income to African-Americans. But again, remember the first thing that I noted um, in terms of we're interested in having a conversation about the broad costs of this, right? So we see a loss of income to African-Americans. That has a broader impact as well. Uh, to the tune of about $8 billion uh, impact to our region's GDP. So that is a much broader loss in addition to um, an individual loss in income for African Americans. For lost lives, so um, I, I am aware that the um, high levels of gun violence that we're experiencing in Chicago is national news. We took a look at uh, our 2016 homicide figures um, for the city of Chicago alone. I should note this is, an, this is entirely looking by region across the country, but we didn't have 2016 numbers for the Chicago region. So looking at the Chicago city alone in 2016, a 30% decrease in homicides would have meant almost 230 more lives saved in Chicago. It's a big deal. Zooming back out to the region in 2010, we see that um, we, have many we have many impacts um, in terms of cost. We have cost in, in terms of the lost income of the individuals whose lives were lost. We have uh, costs in terms of um, policing and corrections impacts. And we also see that there's an impact overall in the real estate market. In fact, um, there was a study by um, Stephen Levitt who showed that for every additional homicide from the year before, you see an, um, you see an additional 70 people leave an area. For a, um, a region like Chicago that's losing population, this is also a huge impact um, across the entire region. And finally, on lost potential, we see that um, had the Chicago region been at the median level of African-American white segregation in 2000, by 2010, we would have seen 83,000 more bachelor's degrees attained by African Americans and whites. And that has an impact um, in uh, a gap, um, a, a large gap in total lifetime earnings uh, for those individuals. So nationally, just to put um, this in some of the context of what we learned nationally, I think it's worth noting, we have a map here that shows, um, so these are, the, these are the 100 regions that Rolf showed you that we studied. The ones that are labeled are showing you the top 10 of combined racial and economic segregation. And um, I think Chicago's number five on that, on that list. I think it's important to note that all 10 of those that are in the top 10 um, of combined racial and economic segregation are, including Los Angeles, uh, great migration legacy cities. And I think this, this goes to Rolf's point, right? Of a, we have an incredibly painful legacy from the choices uh, that we as cities and regions began to, uh, in part, over 100 years ago with the start in earnest of the Great Migration. So we're having a national conversation today, but I think this is a really important conversation internationally. Early next year, I'll be in Brussels with the German Marshall Fund talking about the fact that as European cities, many of whom, for and fairly recently, now dealing with an influx of new immigrants, how can they make better choices about where people live in their communities and not repeat the same mistakes that we made here in our country? Um, so one of the things, this was something we worked really hard with with Urban Institute was to figure out how do we find a way to talk about what, what being at the median um, in racial and economic segregation uh, means. Oh, sorry, that's my next slide. Well, I'll cover this one now. So. Um, <laughs> So here's our quick rankings. We're fifth in our combined racial and economic segregation. We're ninth uh, highest on Latino white segregation, 10th for African American white segregation, and 20th for economic. So three of those were in the top 10, which is not a top 10 list that you wanna be on. And so we were interested in determining um, what does it look like to be um, at or near the median of the 100 metros that we looked at. And, and who are those places? So you can see Chicago on the top on the thick red line. And you can see three regions that we selected that are near the median. And the reason that we're showing only three is that it was important that 
we determine regions that had a similar racial makeup percentage-wise as Chicago because so much of uh, these impacts are based on race and racism. It would not make sense to compare us to a region with very low numbers of people of color. So we're looking at Atlanta, Houston, Raleigh, Durham. We're particularly interested in uh, the example of Atlanta, which you can see during the same time period from 1990 to 2010, Chicago dropped from eighth to 10th. Atlanta dropped 20 places. We're very interested in understanding um, what happened there, how much of that is deliberate, how much of that is about um, an influx of new population, in fact, many of whom we know come from Chicago, uh, that we're losing people to Atlanta. So um, these are things we're interested in looking at in this current and, and future phase. I also wanted to show here um, visually, what does um, a region that's near the median in, uh, in e racial segregation look like? Here's Chicago on the left, and here's Houston on the right. And so you can see that one, one of the questions we've gotten in this work is people saying, well, are you saying that, that no one can live near someone who looks like them, right? That's emphatically not what we're saying. And in fact, if you look at Houston, you can see there are still groupings of people who may choose to live near others like them, it's just a pattern that is much less intense than Chicago's version of that, which is on your left. So this, um, I'll make this my final slide, um, and this was um, to look at what would it actually take. This was our attempt to try to get at a sense of scale and magnitude. What would it take to get Chicago to the median from, from the levels where we are in, uh, in the top 10? So um, the, the lighter bars here for each one, you can see there's, there's a column each for economic segregation, African American white, and Latino white. The lighter bars for each show the progress that we've made from 1990 to 2000, 2000 to 2010. So the good news on this, on this graph is that unlike any other metro that we studied of the 100, Chicago's actually the only metro that um, improved in segregation across all three measures across those three time periods. The only metro to do so. However, if you look at the darkest bars, the darkest orange columns show you how far we would have to go to get to the median. And you can see that the, the biggest and most profound change that's needed is in African American white segregation. And in fact, Urban noted that at our current pace that, uh, that we've been decreasing in segregation, we would not reach the median until 2070. So, one of the points of, uh, that's really come out of this research for us is to note that um, you know, with lost lives, lost income, lost educational potential, we don't have that kind of time. We've got to figure out how to move more quickly and more deliberately toward our goals. So I'll stop there. Uh, we're going to transition to our panel, and uh, Yana Kachoris will be moderating our panel. Yana is a senior program officer at the MacArthur Foundation, and Fortunately for Urban Institute, she's also currently a visiting fellow at Urban, and um, she's really helped to organize this event today. Thanks. So good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. And, and welcome to um, all of our panelists. Now joining us on the dais is um, Joanna Trotter, um, who is also a senior program officer at the Chicago Community Trust, um, and Gustavo Velasquez, director of the Washington Area Research Initiative here at the Urban Institute. So I want to um, first thank you all for being here, as well as our, our esteemed panelists. And um, I, I can, I'm, I'm sure with the presentations that you all just heard, you have lots of questions. And we'll leave time for that um, at the end. And for those of, us, uh, for those of you who are joining um, via webcast, uh, we are going to be opening up to questions. And we invite you to submit your questions to events at urban.org. Um, so this, there's a lot of food for thought um, on the, the presentations that we just heard from Rolf and Marisa and, and Erica's uh, introduction <coughs> of this work and that there's some profound questions. Um, we do want this conversation to, to not just be about Chicago but also sort of the, the national um, trends that we see in, in segregation. So I'd like to start with Gustavo. 
um, to give us your perspective um, on these findings from Chicago and how it might be reflected in other places that you've um, traveled to and visited and, and as well as, as here in DC. I wonder if you could start with some reflections on that. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I like examples. Uh, I'm not a researcher, so um, I only have live experiences. Researchers have live experiences in the intellect to conduct the research. I only have the former, so <laughs> I, um, uh, I do prefer to go by examples. And uh, it is, um, you know, the information that has been provided through the, re through the report is so striking. Um, I, uh, because of the underlying question is what else is happening, you know, beyond Chicago. I remember about three years ago when I started my tenure at HUD, one of the first um, trips that I wanted to do is to go and visit the St. Louis region, uh, not too far from Chicago, uh, because, you know, it was the time where the Ferguson situation was, erupted, it was erupting and the, the shooting of Michael Brown. And so I wanted to go and visit some of the very highly segregated areas in, in St. Louis. And uh, I was able to tour a neighborhood, uh, the Jeff Vanderloo neighborhood. I, I remember vividly uh, touring that neighborhood, um, highly African-American, very poor. Um, and I was also taken to a neighborhood that was just about nine miles away, basically a straight line to the west, uh, the Clayton, pre predominantly white, more affluent, just two neighborhoods separated by about nine, nine, ten miles. And I think of the topic of this discussion, the aspect of lost lives. Uh, the life expectancy of the um, poor African-American child growing up in Jeff Vanderloo is 18 years less than the child growing up in the Clayton neighborhood. So coming back from that trip back to DC, I thought to myself, and this is I think relevant to the question of lost lives and the question of the cost of segregation is, and I guess that's really a reflection for all of us, for everybody here in the audience, and for you. If you knew for sure that you would die tomorrow, what is the monetary value that you would put to extending your life by 18 years? Mm. How much would you pay? You know, what, is, what's, what is worth to you that? And um, it is really a factor of uh, that child growing up in an environment where, uh, you know, it is exposure to high cr crime and exposure to, you know, what is the level of exposure to the quality of water, the quality of air, uh, the, the amenities, the opportunities, you know, the quality of the schools, access to transit for the parents to get to and back from work the quality of jobs available, it's all of that. And uh, that exposure to very limited opportunity is what, um, uh, what is so striking and what compounds the problem of um, life expectancy and, and quality of life in general for people that are living in uh, concentrated areas of poverty and, and, and racially concentrated. Now in DC, you know, DC has done, um, some progress, but we still are confronted by the, the legacy that Rolf spoke about of segregation, very markedly um, the divide by, you know, we have these artificial intentional barriers created in our cities. Sometimes they're train tracks, sometimes they're highways. In our city is a river, the Anacostia River, that continues to just separate in such a huge way the city. Not long ago, uh, east of the river, Ward 7 and Ward 8, where conservatively, I'm saying 100, 150,000 people living there, not long ago, there were two sit-down restaurants. Still, when you go there, still the availability of grocery stores is, compared to the West, is, is, is enormous. Mm -hmm. 
uh, schools have improved, and I think there is a concerted effort to revitalize uh, Anacostia, and I think you know, there is a lot of fear also because you, we've seen the experience in the Shaw neighborhood and in H Street and Noma, so that could be the next neighborhood that transitions in that way. But, but certainly, um, things are getting better in terms of access to opportunity, but uh, we still live in a highly segregated city here in D.C., just like what happens nation, uh, nationwide, economic segregation, uh, racial segregation is declining, economic segregation not so much, and that's the case here. As a region, we have great examples of very integrated uh, communities that are advancing in Prince George's County and in Montgomery County and even in Northern Virginia and in some neighborhoods of D.C. Certainly, a um, good experience of a place like Columbia Heights, for example, it's, it's a good example. So we are making progress, but um, it is critically important that studies like this are replicated. We need more of this information in other regions, the DC region, uh, Baltimore, you know, just really across the country, really to understand uh, the, the, the cost of these problems that are uh, so uh, striking across the country. Yeah, well, and thank you for sharing um, those experiences from, from St. Louis and DC and the real the human connection to, to what these costs really mean um, is really important. And Rolf talked really uh, profoundly and eloquently in his opening about how deliberately we've created the, the, the patterns of segregation both economically and racially that we have in, in Chicago and, and metros across the country in DC and St. Louis. Um, I'm, I think we need to be as deliberate and intentional to change those patterns. And so I'm wondering, Marisa, if you could share with us now about where the project is in this next phase um, of developing a set of policy ideas that will address these patterns as well as the costs associated with, with segregation um, in Chicago. Sure. Um, you know, and the, the way that we're addressing this, uh, trying to get to Yana's question in our current phase kind of goes back to our first phase where we established a group of advisors that were from all kinds of backgrounds across the Chicago region who've been working with us throughout and have in fact pushed us on a lot of questions, um, very basic to this work throughout, um, and have been part of uh, different policy topic working groups, right? So we've had working groups around housing policies and public safety, public health, education, et cetera, to really try to delve into the, the kinds of policy changes um, that are best practice around the country and that we may want to think about in different locations. Now in our current phase of work, we're taking that, uh, that work that we did throughout the past year, and what we've done is to really try to think about the typologies of the kinds of neighborhoods, the kinds of areas around our region where we have the most questions about how these kind of policies might or might not work. And then to go do, this summer we're doing um, an entire qualitative research project where we're interviewing people in each of those kinds of geographies, and I'll give a few examples, to really ask them to get down to some of the nitty gritty questions that I think we don't do enough of when we just sort of publish a toolkit or say here are some good ideas, but instead we don't say in this type of community, what would need to happen for this to work? What are your political challenges if you're a city council member, right? What would you need in order to get this passed? What are the fiscal realities that you would need in order to justify making this kind of change? I don't think we spend enough time on those really you know, nitty gritty kinds of questions. And so that's what we're trying to do right now. So we've, we've looked at different types of communities and we have you know, kind of the two typical extremes. We've got areas of concentrated white wealth or white middle class. We have areas of concentrated poverty with people of color. And then we have some areas where um, there's a lot more nuance going on. Areas where we've got areas that are shifting from older and whiter to younger and blacker and browner areas where we see um, they're largely people of color and we have a mix of class within those spaces, but we have some pockets of persistent disinvestment within them. And how do we think about those spaces? How do we think about where areas where there may be rising property value levels and maybe we're not seeing displacement yet, but we wanna understand what would help us understand those triggers better so we're not playing catch up later. So those are the spaces in which we're doing interviews all this summer to try to move us toward some very informed policy recommendations 
uh, that we'll be issuing early next year. We're also continuing to work during this phase with Rolf and his team, and I'll just invite you to jump in on some of the work that, um, that the piece of this that you're doing in this portion. Sure, I, I can talk about that in a sec, but I, I think um, I want to give a little bit of evidence base to the value of approaching the problem in this way and try to distinguish it from the way that policy is sometimes thought of as if it were a drug you could just administer and know that it was going to have a certain effect. Um, a lot of these policies and ideas that Marisa and her uh, teams are, are talking about in Chicago haven't really been tried at scale or together yet. So honestly, we can't tell people in the community, if you try this, you're going to get less segregated, you're going to get more investment in your community. Um, it is an experiment in action. Uh, so what's the theory of change there? What, you know, what happens if they're wrong? What, what happens if these policies don't work like people want them to? Well, the, the theory goes, and it's supported by people who studied planning processes over the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, that once people acknowledge there's an issue they want to work on together, uh, they're, they're starting with something that's called the social definition of reality. They are starting to reframe uh, their whole world based on the idea that one, we can benefit from living more inclusively, and two, we can in fact do something about it. So the process of discovery of these groups in their communities with their elected officials and others and stakeholders, that whole process creates the momentum that one will need, even if the initial answers don't work, to continue working together. Because we know that some of these things, just that they're not going to bear as much fruit as people want. But the more people continue to work on it, goes the theory, and we'll see if, if I'm right, but there's good evidence that this is true. The more they work together, the closer they'll get to the goal, and the more they'll lock into uh, policies and programs both locally and at the county level, at the regional level, even at the state government level, that make it more likely that their community will be more inclusive in the future. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to say, you know, Urban, we do a lot of work on, on the policy level. On the politics level, the community politics level, um, that's not necessarily as much our specialty, but I do think there's a strong evidence base um, for, for this thinking about, like, why do you think this might work? As for the work that Urban is doing next, um, we're really trying to take this idea of looking toward the future and asking the question, well, if, as we know it is, Chicago is getting older, and if, as we know it is, uh, the, the bulk of the new growth is being, is being uh, fueled by Latinos and Asians and not so much by white, non-Hispanics or African Americans, um, what is this whole city going to look like in terms of its composition by race and income and age in 15 or 20 years, right? So what's the baseline? And then how are these policies going to work out, not just to fix what we have now, but to try to steer the baseline so that it gets better than the baseline would otherwise be? So that's a, a conversation between ourselves and MPC about what the policies are, what their goals are, uh, and then what the trend, you know, is looking like. But those, that, that thinking about the future we are not going to be the same country, and Chicago is for sure not going to be the same city in 15 years uh, a, a, as we are and as they are now. Well, and I think what you said earlier in your, uh, in your remarks about how we can um, harness, harness those shifts and use the creativity and will to, to channel uh, better outcomes. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what are some of the specific policy ideas, too. Maurice, if you could expand. We heard from Gustavo. Um, about land use and transportation and housing and education and really this connection to, to violence in communities and wh how all these things sort of interconnect and weave together. What are, how are you thinking about that? What are some of the policies uh, that your groups um, are working with the folks at Urban to think about? Sure. Um, I have a, a few examples that run the gamut across the different topics that we've been thinking through. Um, and they range from education to transportation to all kinds of things. But I'll, I'll pick out a few. Um, one would be, uh, you know, how do we, if, if we think about, for those of you who are familiar with health impact assessments, um, and that's been a really important tool in the public health field, how would we think about adapting a measure like that? And Yana, you and I have talked about this, um, to think about like a real estate impact assessment tool that would allow us to think when you have something like 
um, a major um, public uh, trail like we've had in Chicago, um, like a presidential library and center like we're going to have in Chicago. When you have um, major impacts like that, how do we actually get better at understanding the impact they're going to have and planning on the front end for those things and being very proactive as municipalities and putting things in place and communities, putting things in place to ensure um, that a range of incomes can stay in those neighborhoods and so on. So developing that sort of tool better is uh, one that we're exploring. Expanding exception rents for housing choice voucher holders so that we don't have um, kind of real structural problems in terms of where people who are using a tool that's supposed to give them choice, but their choices end up being incredibly constrained. Um, eliminating the cash bail system, right? That has a real impact um, for uh, people who are predominantly young men of color who um, have not even gone to trial but are losing their employment and, and distance from their family um, when they haven't even had due process because they simply don't have the money to, to post bail. Um, that's a major problem for communities. Um, how do we expand the use of supportive housing for ex-offenders? Um, Intersuburban express bus service to get people to and from employment hubs. Thinking about including things um, of an equity measure in performance measures for transportation when you're assessing whether new transportation is a fit, that we should be looking beyond just ridership to things like, um, does this allow for a more equitable system um, to serve our region? And, and then really, ideas that are, um, that are aspatial, that are not based in a particular place, but that really get at the equity issues that segregation um, really perpetuates. And so an example of that might be to think about whether, um, because we have such high levels of racial wealth gaps, could we think about um, the impact of um, an earned income tax credit at the city level or at the county level, coupled with a federal and a state um, earned income tax credit. So those are a few examples of things that we're working through. Great. And Gustavo, I wonder if you can um, also talk about what these findings and what you're seeing in, in places around the country and here in DC. What can local policymakers, state policymakers, federal policymakers do about this um, segregation and the accompanying costs and sort of piggybacking on what uh, Marisa said? What, what would you um, say are the policy levers that people can <coughs> pull? There, there are many, and they, they've been uh, put in, in research for, for some time. I mean, Marisa's examples are, are great in terms of the, the options that local leaders at the county, state, and local level have at their disposal. Um, uh, another example, one of the, um, in my opinion, one of the most significant desegregation national policies in recent times is uh, came out uh, towards the end of the Obama administration, uh, the affirmatively for the fair housing regulation um, that um, you know was was bill was created. By the way, well, this was a national policy that was really 17 years in the making. It was attempted as a as a critical desegregation policy by in the Clinton years, uh, but the the honestly the the lobbying power of, of governors and mayors made it fail. Uh, out of basically fear that uh, cities would lose funding, if uh, federal funding, if they weren't doing enough to combat uh, and reverse the legacy of segregation in their communities. Well, fast forward, you know, President Obama was, was decisive in making this uh, national policy a, a reality. And it happened with uh, quite a lot of controversy and growing pains, but, but the, the elements that are in this policy uh, came very much out of evidence and research. Uh, three critical ingredients um, that local communities, in partnership with the national government and the state governments, uh, are part of this, you know, have to follow and are part of this policy, is first and foremost, uh, the, the most critical uh, fundamental ingredient is community participation. And, you know, Rolf talks about, you know, that's there's, there's evidence there of the, the effect of, of a robust community engagement and participation that is deep and broad. Uh, <coughs> a, and it, it really is about a, an, an important infrastructure of community organizing and people from all spectrum of you know, stakeholders from the entire spectrum of a local community that come together to uh, serious, in-depth community planning. And, uh, this uh, effort uh, was put on paper uh, 
as part of the experience of uh, an initiative out of HUD called the uh, Sustainable Communities Initiative, which is a, an initiative to make cities more resilient. And as part of the requirement of uh, cities getting money uh, under this initiative was the, uh, uh, the aspect of uh, building equity networks in their communities and creating assessments, uh, equity assessments, in order for them to obtain the resources uh, to apply in resilience planning. And mm -hmm. uh, again, I cannot emphasize how important uh, this is. Uh, it, it is the, the robust infrastructure that needs to take place for community mm -hmm. participation. Mm -hmm. The second ingredient is uh, nationally available data, of course, and locally available data that can give government officials and the community a, a very good clear picture of where the patterns of segregation are, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the racial segregation and economic segregation intersects, what are the relationship between the areas of segregation with quality of the schools, access to transit, access to jobs, uh, uh, exposure to environmental hazards. That data needs to be really in front of all the decision makers and the community that participate in these dialogues. And finally, the strategies, and that's you know, where there is a wide range of uh, strategies leading to you know, investments, concerning investment strategies in distressed neighborhoods, also some mobility strategies. I think it's really about, all about a, a balanced approach when it comes to utilizing housing resources, but also transportation resources and education resources. And so it is, um, I think it was a well-crafted policy. We, um, we are in the midst, uh, many cities, of the implementation of this policy. Uh, we are hearing some you know, uh, mixed um, reports. But, but all in all, I think local uh, communities and local uh, elected officials and local government officials are using this policy well. And it's one of the tools. I'm not saying this is the answer. It's just one of the tools available but it's an example of the levers. Remember, this policy ha sits in a very robust legal and regulatory environment. So it's, it, there, there are some uh, carrots and sticks associated to this, to this policy. But it is one tool that cities definitely uh, and regions can use uh, to lower their levels of both economic and racial right. And I add one, yeah, I, I think also just for local cities to consider, and Marisa probably didn't mention this because we're starting to work on this in Chicago already, but, but thinking about disproportionate, out, disproportionate outcomes being matched with disproportionate investment. So in the city of Chicago, we're, we're looking and we've started to implement impact fees for density that's happening in the downtown loop area, that then that investment gets captured and brought to areas of, of disinvestment in particular in communities of color. So for example, uh, one downtown relocation actually was able to fund 32 small businesses in terms of rehab and support through direct grants. Um, another example that they're starting to look at is in areas of high opportunity, we're starting to see a chipping away at some of our industrial corridors where those industrial corridors are turning into mixed income and other types of uses is actually capturing an impact fee through that and putting that into manufacturing in communities of color. So I think that's going to be really critical next up for many cities across the region, really thinking about their local ability to capture that in order to invest disproportionately and equitably in communities that have lacked that for many years. I think that's a really great point and is something that um, I, I think Chicago, just over the last couple years has really taken a lead on because it's um, you know it's not a place where um, from border to border we're um, booming with affluence or um, struggling completely with disinvestment we have very very different places within our border and I think as a city this is a city specific comment um, our, our gov city government has been much more proactive in the last couple years mm -hmm. of really trying to capture growth in one area for the betterment of um, of areas that are struggling. The other thing I just want to throw in that, um, that your comment made me think of is that in, you know we're a policy change organization, so we immediately gravitate toward actual policies. Um, but a lot, I've been surprised at how much, as we've been in conversation on this project, how much um, I've heard from people in community settings that say, we're not even ready to talk about policies. We actually need to just figure out how to talk to each other mm -hmm. before we can even move that in that direction. So one of the things we're really trying to understand better, and if people have ideas about this, please let me know, is how do we do community dialogue better? How do we help? I mean, this is the very thing that segregation 
makes harder, right? Is that we are so separate from each other that, um, and we're so, um, you know, hemmed in by fears of other people that um, it's very hard to have a conversation about our shared humanity yep. as a starting place. And we've got to get better at that. And I am really looking for good ideas. So, and what we found in Chicago, which I, it may be more nuanced for us, but because of the high levels of racial segregation, to me, how that carries out in many cases in local communities, predominantly communities of color, is class warfare within those communities, where middle com income African Americans feel more economically insecure and are more threatened by people who have lower incomes coming into the community or threatening. If you've spent the last 10 years watching your housing values reduced, you're very concerned about another low income development, right? And so there's some of that just tension that we have to work out that that has carried out locally and in economic ways that carry out more regionally in, in I think, racial terms. I think um, building on this conversation, because I think this is a really important um, barrier to overcome and, and kind of having these conversations, I think it would be useful to share with folks how these research findings have landed um, in Chicago. And Joanna, I'm wondering if you could start um, as um, to share your reactions and observations about how the research has been received and some of the conversations that have, have emerged. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll start with just a, a personal example. Um, and I'll go back and reflect on some of Marisa's opening remarks around this dialogue between is the solution to segregation integration, right? So I'll just paint a picture quickly. I live in a community called South Shore. Um, I won't tell you uh, the demographics yet about South Shore, but if, if I list the assets of South Shore, we're a lakeside community. I'm three blocks from, from Lake Michigan. I live near the beach. We have a beautiful cultural center. I live near a park that was designed by Frederick Log Olmsted, which is the same designer as, as Central Park. Uh, we have a commuter rail system that will get us downtown in 10 minutes. We are a mixed community in terms of housing types, where we have beautiful stately single family homes, well manicured lawns. We all know each other. We have dense portions of South Shore with uh, dense multifamily and condo uh, development there. Um, so I would love to you know, just ask the audience, and I can't, but what you would picture in terms of the kind of offerings a community like this would have. And then you just juxtapose that with the fact that we're 96% African American. And what that translates to me for is, it is the fact that our vacancy rate on our commercial corridors is 62%, or 32%, excuse me. Um, uh, we don't have good choices in school. Many of my neighbors are paying $20,000 a year in private school tuition, right? I mean, there's things like that. We have um, a real issue with crime and homicide. It is, it, you know, I have issues with the way that we're depicted in the media often. I think it's much more nuanced, but it's unacceptable, right? And so for that, it's such a stark reality for us that um, this is the cost of segregation for our community. So how the framing of integration then lands for us is, does it really take white people, <laughs> when we have all these assets in these communities and we have people here working and investing in our neighborhood, does it really take the fact that white people come in for us to actually get the, the, the investment that we deserve, right, as, as communities? And I think that's the challenge. And, and the framing of integration is much more nuanced than that, but that's how it lands for people. So I think it is important to talk about access to opportunity and disproportionate investment of communities that have have dealt with and grappled with disinvestment that is completely unnatural aside from the fact that there is a system of racism, right? And I think we really need to think about and frame it in that nuanced way that it's two different, two different approaches. And for communities, particularly African American communities, we don't gentrify across the country in the same way that other communities do. And so for us, it's really about um, equitable investment. But then we look at Latino communities. And if you say all it does, it's, it, it just takes white people to come in, what that means for them is dip disproportionate displacement, right? Is that if you, if you leave it to just integrating and not putting all of the safety net to make sure that the people who live there now can stay, then that's an issue too. Okay, so, so, so then I get displaced and the market takes over and I can't live there and I have to move to yet another area that it doesn't provide me the same opportunity. So that's, that's, the, that's the nuance that I think is important for everybody to understand as this kind of research lands in other communities is, is that's the nuance that we need to strike and to make sure that we're framing it that way. What I'm really excited about with this research is it really has started, and I, I'm not gonna say that it has influences other research pieces, but I think there's been this drum roll of other seminal pieces that have followed it, um, including uh, the racial wealth gap that, um, that CFED released for the city of Chicago. And I'll just give you one statistic. Um, over 63%, 65% of households of color in Chicago are um, 
are in liquid wealth poverty, which means that if they lost their income, they couldn't go for more than three months without going below the poverty line. So 65% of households couldn't live three months um, based on the, the level of assets they have. The Chicago Urban League has been, is midstream in releasing a series of reports. The first one was looking at um, African American segregation and looking at the impacts in terms of housing and transportation. The other one that they just released is looking at education and then they're looking next at neighborhood economies. So that's another piece that's coming out um, in our region. And then the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, did a report called The Tale of Three Cities. So Chicago is essentially the city itself divided in three parts in terms of uh, demographics. So about a third African American, about a third Latino, about a third white. And what I think the UIC report really illustrated is that means a very different experience in city for those different populations. So just to th throw a few statistics out there, edu educational attainment does not alleviate racial inequities in income or unemployment. Um, even black Chicagoans with advanced degrees are more likely to be unemployed than whites who have only a bachelor's degree. It doesn't matter the earnings in terms of who is segregated. Black households earning over 100,000 are just as likely as black households learning less than 25,000 to be segregated from whites. Um, and income disparities among racial and ethnic groups are wider today than they were during the civil rights era in Chicago. So all of this to say is that there has been this just incredible drum roll. Um, and that's been really beneficial to us at the trust, to the community, and what we're finding is that more people are talking about this. And I think what has been most important about the cost of segregation is because it's looking at the region, what it has demonstrated, to me at least, is that Often in Chicago, we're pretty complacent. We know we're segregated. We, we blame the, the historical structures in terms of redlining and the Housing Act. But when you think about the recent growth that we've seen in Chicago and the region as a whole, the fact that despite, without those incentives in place, without those kind of regulatory um, structures that had caused segregation in the past, we've still managed to follow those same segregation patterns. That's a lot to unpack for us to figure out why that is, right? What's the more, these are more nuanced now, more pervasive issues that are hard to pinpoint. Um, and it's going to really cause, I think, a lot of dialogue at the local level. Marisa, were you wanting to, to, to reflect sure. on this as well? Yeah, and I, I think um, the interesting thing about having worked with a group of advisors on this project, and, and Jana and Joanna have been part of that, uh, back starting in November of 2015, is that you know I would say some of the um, pushback, um, conversation, dialogue about this started back then, not, not only since the release, right? And so there's a couple things that came up in that, even in that very first meeting that we had. One is about ethnic enclaves um, and kind of the, the pushback. And I, I will say this is from people of all races and all incomes. I, and that's important to note. It's a really nuanced thing to, to try to address, right? Um, one is about ethnic enclaves. Ethnic enclaves are incredible places. Why would you want to break them up or, or say there's anything wrong with them? The other um, is to Joanna's point around um, why should people of color somehow need white people to get the investments they should just have in their neighborhoods? Um, if, we just into, if we just invested in our communities more equitably, then we wouldn't need to be focused on integration. And those are two are, are two things we have really spent a lot of time in dialogue about. And so I'll just, I could, if I've got a second, I'll try to address them quickly. Um, I, think, I think the ethnic enclave question, we're, first of all, we're emphatically not in the business of breaking up ethnic enclaves. Um, my father grew up in a Sicilian enclave in Detroit I, for, and really uh, benefited from all of the cultural and economic benefits that come with that. But I, I do think that with, we need to be honest about how different the ethnic enclave experience is by race and ethnicity and the ability to sort of move between them is very different to based on your race and your ethnicity. And also when we say things like people just want to live near people like them, um, I think it's with the conception that there's kind of a free marketplace of, of choices, right? And, and in fact, we need to acknowledge that that's not true. Traditionally, we have constrained those choices such that I'm not even sure any of us know what we would choose if we could do whatever we wanted because we have never had that sort of freedom and especially if you're a person of, con of color whose incomes are more constrained and especially in Chicago if you're African American. So I just think we need to be a lot more honest about the constraints of that when we talk about choices. Um, and the, to the second piece um, about um, you know why should people of color have to have white people, I think that I cannot 
um, overstate how important that uh, that whole yeah. discussion is, right? And um, it's it's incredibly important. We've absolutely heard that argument. Uh, one, a sociologist at Northwestern, who many folks know, Mary Patillo, has said. Uh, proximity to whiteness is not a solution unless we start from the premise that the problem is blackness, right? So I think we in policy and research fields need to do a much better job of clearly de delineating that it's not that the problem is blackness or brownness, it's that the problem is racism. And that if we're looking at the realities of racism today, that forces us to acknowledge um, some things that are, are really problematic in 2017, right? That we continue to have huge gaps in, uh, in wealth and educational attainment and incarceration and so on by race, and that there continues to be huge amounts of racism in housing and retail markets. And given that, that there's a level of deliberateness, as we've kind of all been talking about, that needs to happen to undo that. And I. I want to come to you, Gustavo, about how this conversation is also playing out in other in DC oh, yeah. and in other parts of the country. Um, but before I do that, I just want to remind folks who are um, joining by webcast, we're going to open it up for Q&A in about seven or eight minutes. So um, think about your questions. Um, clearly, there's, this is an incredibly thoughtful panel. Um, and I'm very privileged to, to get to work with all of them. Um, and I, I think I'm sure there's lots of conversations and questions that you all have that you'd like to, to ha have with these folks. But Gustavo, yeah. can, you, can you tell us your thoughts on Well, everything, on all, all the examples that have been said, uh, Joanna and, and Marisa, um, really apply uh, to DC. I mean, it, it, we all know the benefits of integration. I mean, the report highlights that um, in highly segregated um, uh, areas, it, the level of educational attainment is going to be less for, you know, across racial lines for, for blacks and whites. Uh, people studying school integration have, and we've known for, for, for a long time that in diverse integrated schools, all kids will do better. So we know those benefits, but we're also keenly aware about the, the narrative of, you know, the integration argument being the argument that uh, is the only one used to talk about desegregating communities. Here in DC, uh, what Marisa was saying in terms of you know, e equitable investments is what people you know, in Ward 7, Ward 8 have been asking. It, it, the conversation is less so about uh, integration. In fact, there is really a big pushback. They're, they're seeing what happened to Shaw uh, and to areas around H Street, and it really for, for those communities is, has always been about what about resources that are investing in our communities to have the level of school proficiency and school quality here as in, in the Northwest Quadrant. Uh, when you look at communities in Montgomery and Prince George's County, the argument with the purple line that is right now on a standstill is you know where are we in you know where where are those resources for uh, to, to enable better transportation going to come to our communities as well as they have in other communities for quite some time. So again, it is the argument he's, here has to be an argument of the benefits of integration, but more so access to opportunity, leveling the playing field for all communities, ensuring that all communities have. Um, uh, what will make them, you know, thrive and be, you know, participate of the richness of this? Because the, all of these cities that we're looking on the map, they're 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 wealthy cities. They have a you know an enormous amount of resources and wealth, and it's really about equitable, shared prosperity across all neighborhoods. And did you want to jump in, Ron? Yeah, I I also think that the framing of integration versus investment, I want to come back to the, the question of growth and demographic change. We have never seen a baby boom get old in the United States before. That's happening right now. And the baby boomers have transformed cities since they were born in every single phase of their life course so far. I mean, the city that we live in now 
is pretty much the city that America built, the metropolitan area that American built, America built for the baby boomers. And, and one of the biggest elements of change and of household growth in lots of places, including Chicago, is the net growth in seniors that's going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a lot of new seniors flooding into Chicago from somewhere else. They're mostly people who are baby boomers, and they may be in their 50s and early 60s now. And they're going to be over 65 in 10 or 15 years. We don't know what it means to try to build and reinvest in neighborhoods that were built for, for those folks when they were raising young families in the suburbs. And yet, those places are fundamentally going to be extremely different. We need ways to think about those places as opportunities, especially given that the increment of growth is mostly people of color. So the argument over you know, integration versus reinvestment, we're really fixated on the neighborhoods that haven't gotten the investment that they need. And that's important. But we really need to think also about what we can do to take advantage of this moment in which the baby boom is, is aging across a huge expanse of metropolitan areas. That's low density, single family houses. Think about all that land. Think about all that value. So, th so thinking about the fact that Latino households and Asian households are the biggest increment of growth, I, I think you know, in a way the, the fact that, that Marisa and her team are working mostly inside the city of Chicago, we sort of need a complement to that for suburban areas, and, and you're working in Cook County uh, too. And so thinking about like, how to leverage growth and aging at the same time to build inclusion in areas that we know are going to be changing and to sort of smooth that process of transition in a lot of those communities. Because it could be very, it, it could be very constructive for both reinvestment um, and, and more inclusion in those neighborhoods. And, and I think with this, what this report and what um, this conversation really highlights is that you know, that inclusion is so critical for economic growth in all of these cities that we're talking about. We're not going to grow in the ways that we anticipate or expect if we don't approach it from an inclusive um, perspective, and I think that's a really important um, takeaway from this research. Um, so we're going to open it up now for questions um, from the audience. Um, I would just ask that you um, introduce yourself and your affiliation and make sure that it is a question. Um, we appreciate <laughs> that. Um, in the back over there. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Stromberg. I work at HUD, but I am not representing HUD. Um, I, so you talked a lot about um, how integration isn't necessarily the solution uh, to kind of fixing the problems in these communities that are highly segregated. So I'm, I have two questions about that. One, uh, do you have any examples of how these uh, problems have been addressed without relying on higher income households moving into neighborhoods? And, um, excuse me, I don't do well standing in front of crowds and so. Um, and my other question is, with the research design, um, since integration isn't really a solution, why focus on segregation in the first place? So doing an econometric analysis of um, segregation in a community kind of relies on integration being the solution, right? So I'm wondering what you might do following up to this to kind of deal with that mismatch. Yeah, I, I could start with the, the second of those two questions. Um, I, I think the message that, that segregation matters and that inclusion and diversity can help, especially given, as I've been saying, that our demographic composition is changing really fast, um, suggests that there are ways that you can build new places and rebuild the places that we have without telling people that their neighborhoods just have to change. My favorite example of that is Columbia, Maryland, which was built in the 1960s with a plan for integration. And now it's coming up on its 50th anniversary. And Columbia, Maryland is one of the most integrated communities in the United States. So they, they did that on purpose, too. Um, it took a lot of work. And it takes work to reinvest and sustain that, that community. It's a, it's not a very walkable community. It's, you know, it's infrastructure showing its age. 
um, you know, we need commitments to reinforce those places too. Um, so that, sort of that's, that's my, so why do we focus so much on it? I, I think it's still important to talk about the benefits of inclusion and of economic and racial uh, integration. Um, but to say that that has been a problem in the past doesn't mean that the only solution for what we have and what we're going to have is limited to more diversity. And that investment can only follow integration, I think, is the challenge in terms of how it lands in communities of color. To me, the investment should lead. And if people come, then it becomes a more vibrant and welcoming community. But if it's because it, the investment only follows a certain demographic, then that's a challenge for communities of color who have been fighting the good fight for 20 years, right, and trying to attract investment in their communities. So that's, it's sort of, it's just the cart before the horse. Like, you need to lead with investment in areas that have been traditionally discriminated against for many decades. And with, with that lead, then there could be an intentional sort of social conversation where that's community driven, that's bottom up around what the future of this community looks like and what does integration look like for them, right? But so often it's about we're going to regulate this in some way feels very dismissive to communities that invest for a long time. And then I think, again, it's, it's this nuance between areas of disinvestment in largely communities of color and the need for integration in areas that have been exclusive to those communities. It's this issue of access to opportunity. And it's a, it's a both and, not a year or. I, I also want to just follow up with the thought that there are a lot of people who live now in struggling neighborhoods in, in, in cities both small and large across the United States. They, at, at a point where they reach a certain level of success or their kids you know, are, are looking at you know, schools that aren't great, um, isn't it too bad that their only choice is to move somewhere else? We are hemorrhaging right? in Chicago. So we're not, we're yeah. not ta just talking about attracting new people who are different into the neighborhoods. That, yeah. We're talking about giving the people who have a choice to stay in their neighborhoods, their neighborhoods, the ability to stay in their neighborhoods and making it a reasonable, a rational choice for them to do that. And you know what? If they're going to do that, then other people are going to make that choice too. Right. And if they're there, and if their familiar faces are seen at the, uh, you know, you know, at the city council meeting or at the post office, people don't have to go to post offices anymore. <laughs> so, you know, on the jogging trail or whatever it is, th then that that signals something to everyone. Right. I, I think it's this this question of of neighborhood change. I think it's it, you know, it, what are we fighting about when we're fighting over gentrification? Maybe that's a conversation for later over lunch or something, but it's, it's not just about having more diverse people in your community. It's, it's about losing a sense of control and of, of, of home, of, of safety, of a safe space for yourself mm -hmm. and the people who you love. And, and I don't think we cited the stat, um, so help me, Yana and Marisa, right? We lost 200,000 people in 2000 Chicago, or our region, 189, right? 189,000 of them were African American. So we're hemorrhaging. We want, <laughs> we want population back in our communities. And the reason they're leaving is because of the lack of investment. And these are largely middle class families that are leaving because of the lack of choice. Mm -hmm. There's some, um, a couple of questions that we've gotten online about um, gentrification and displacement, which I think is sort of tied to this conversation. So one of the questions um, from Sarah Eikenberry is, um, how can we leverage gentrification in order to benefit the lower income res uh, residents and residents of color, and is this possible? And if I could just tack on, how do we, you know, this conversation around community engagement and participation, how is that important to how we address gentrification? So I, I, this is something we're spending some time thinking about, as I mentioned, with um, when you have an opportunity, so there's times when um, things like rising property value and, um, and then displacement of longer term, lower income people from a neighborhood often seems to sort of happen in this kind of um, Houdini sort of way that people don't quite understand when it started or, or what's happening until it's suddenly rampant and upon you. And I, one, I think we've just got to get better at that and we need better tools and we need our municipalities to be able to be more proactive in the policies that they set. But we have some opportunities when we do things that we know will have an impact on, um, a, on a community, like a major trail, um, which 
we saw on um, running through four north side communities in Chicago called the 606, which has had um, a, a big impact on accelerating, um, I would say, gentrification that was already underway. It's not that it was non-existent, but it certainly mm -hmm. accelerated that process. And now we're looking at an additional trail in another neighborhood in Chicago. And could we then be more proactive about, we're, you know, we're a city that had a major um, a mixed income redevelopment effort called the Plan for Transformation from Public Housing. And at the time when that was at its um, heyday, we as a city set aside half of our low income housing tax credit allocations um, toward that Plan for Transformation, toward the creation of mixed income communities. Um, would, we say, would, we, would we say as a city that we can devote some portion of things very proactively to say, we see that there's some signs of things we need to jump on right now. Right. So that in many of our communities that are disinvested, there's lots of vacant land, there's lots of vacant buildings, there's room for new people to come in without necessarily having to displace anyone. So how do we do that in a way that gets on top of a trend and, and, and be simply proactivity is, is the word I'm really yeah. trying mm -hmm. to get at there. Mm -hmm. the, the, the big investment we're dealing with now is the Obama Library, which is coming to the south side of Chicago, directly impacts my community, South Shore, Woodlawn, Washington Park, um, and, and the community surrounding. And the, the luxury here is that we have 20, till 2021, that's when the, the library comes. That doesn't mean speculation isn't starting to already happen. And so I think we have this really critical moment that we need to radically rethink what inclusive development, I never use the word gentrification, I think it's just too loaded. Um, but inclusive development where we are putting residents who exist there now or live there now front and center in how that sort of investment happens. And that does mean really rethinking about what kind of resource allocations in terms of really monitoring the, mo the market, starting to do the development partnerships that are necessary to ensure that affordable housing stays, whether it's rent control, whether it's sort of land ownership issues. I think we have a, an opportunity, 2021 will come up very quickly, but we often don't have that kind of luxury of at least mm -hmm. that space to really start to project out and think about what the community infrastructure as well needs to look like. This is a, these are communities that don't have their own community development corporation right now, right? So thinking about even the community infrastructure that needs to be put in place to be the equal partner to something like an Obama Foundation coming in and investing in the area, that it's ensuring the procurement, the job training is starting to happen now that prepares people for the jobs to take advantage of not only that investment, but the investments that it's gonna to start to attract into these communities. Mm -hmm. um, in the back over there. I'm Greg Squires, I'm with George Washington University and for many years a board member of the Woodstock Institute in Chicago. My question goes back to some of the earlier statistics you presented and, and I, I'd like you to address the causal mechanism. For example, why is it that white income is lower in highly segregated communities? Why is it that high school or college graduation rates for whites as well as non-whites is lower in, in segregated communities and why is it higher in more integrated communities? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up uh, those findings about the impacts on white non-Hispanics. I meant to mention earlier that um, some research has shown that segregation benefits whites and disbenefits people of color. And our research didn't find that. Our research found often insignificant effects or inf insignificant relationships. Uh, and in some cases, in the case of education, negative relationship between segregation uh, between blacks and whites and whites' educational attainment. Um, so what's the mechanism? Um, the papers that I've seen about the mechanism suggest that when African Americans and whites are racially segregated, spatially segregated, African Americans don't, essentially, they don't uh, have access to the educational opportunity that they need to reach their full potential to contribute in the labor force, in the labor market. And when you have a city, a city is a machine for assembling talent. The reason why we have them is because when we live together densely, we contribute our ideas and our talents to one another no reason to live in cities otherwise. Um, Ed Glazer talks about this a lot. Um, that, that, that is the, that's the motivating force that's, that's making cities denser now. People want to 
live and work downtown now. So when you have African Americans and whites who live apart in cities and African Americans are systematically denied opportunities to reach their full potential, that means there's a substantial number of people in a metropolitan area who aren't meeting their full potential. The, the mechanism that I would propose based on those studies, although it's complicated, right? These are complicated, sort of complex adaptive systems, uh, is that there's, their creativity can't be taken advantage of because they haven't been given the opportunities and they don't have interactions either in the residence, uh, in the neighborhood, or in the workplace that's necessary to take full advantage of that. It's a, you're, you're, you're right that it's a complex question, but that's a proposal based on, on some of the evidence that I know. I think your question gets to um, a, a real question for the field that I don't think we know enough about uh, the negatives of concentrated wealth and concentrated whiteness. And as a field, we don't talk about it enough. Um, such that, to go back to my first comment, we fall into this thing of talking about segregation as, as only about the negatives that accrue to low-income people of color. And um, I think your, the question you raise is a question for our field and one that um, we're really interested in, in spending some more time on. So building on the conversation around narratives and what sort of how we um, have thought about segregation historically and how this work is aiming to shift that, um, there's a question um, online from Elena Harkness, who some of us know well um, at the Brookings Institution. Um, and she asks, uh, or sort of asserts that, you know, as Rolf said in, in his introduction, the patterns of segregation that we see are the result of many decisions by individuals, policymakers, business, businesses. And if we're going to change that pattern, um, how do we reach those folks, how, particularly those um, in the business community? Um, and the sort of benefit cost decisions that they're constantly making about their investment. So what are some of the messages or strategies that, that resonate in reaching those folks who typically don't engage in this conversation as we've, we've talked about? I have one example, okay. but I, I, Go ahead. do you want to start with a larger framing? Okay. okay. <laughs> I feel like I need Marisa to start with the larger framing. But I think, you know, I, I, I look at examples like in, in Chicago, for, we're, we're testing a model um, called Retail Chicago. Uh, this is something that the, the Chicago Community Trust co-invested in with the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Lanier Richardson, who's been a retail developer for decades, African-American gentleman, is trying to reframe the way retailers are looking at communities of color. Um, so he's using sort of this data-driven model that's reframing the market demand in these communities. MacArthur, through their uh, program-related investment, is allowing and providing the capability for him to provide more subsidy and low-interest loans to retailers willing to look in these communities. And he's strategically choosing the communities that where, where retail could kind of make the difference, right? If you invest in this next thing, then we can start to try to sort of change the cycle of investment. And, it's stuff like that, it's much more nuanced, but it's very laser-like and very focused in terms of how we reframe the market demand in these communities. I mean, we all have the, you know, in Chicago, in communities of color, we commute miles to get to a grocery store, right? There's still demand there, we're commuting, we're spending our dollars, we're spending it outside the neighborhood, and it's just another way for us to try to reframe the opportunities that exist in these neighborhoods, but I always lean towards also thinking about ways we grow from within, the way that we incubate our local businesses, the way that we support them. You know, using again this example, this Chicago is investing directly into neighborhoods and businesses of color, um, thinking about how to streamline the whole ecosystem and the way that the financing happens in terms of technical assistance to entrepreneurs of color. I mean, I, th I think there's a number of ways that we can start to really be strategic in the way that we pri provide all the wraparound services that lift lift these communities up and, and build the sort of conversation around wealth that happen at the average white family dinner table in communities, right, that, that don't have that. So we have social services, we've got, you know, you go through this door for affordable housing, you go through this door for workforce development, you go through this separate door for entrepreneurship. Let's weave these together so that we're really thinking about wealth building in communities of color, not just social service and safety net investment. Yeah. The other thing I would, I would add is that in some ways um, the, um, the upside of the downside of a really rough period in Chicago is that there's some truths that are becoming self-evident, that are becoming impossible to ignore. And I think um, 
that's been true for us even in the evolution of this project that when we started this project um, we weren't even calling it we didn't even have the word segregation in the name right we for a while we were using some pretty bland euphemisms um, just internally in our conversations about it just to be able to continue the work and that when we got to a point um, in our city where we um, are reaching levels of gun violence we haven't seen in 20 years when we had um, police shooting of an unarmed African-American 16 times and multiple marches um, as a result. Um, it's become a place where, um, you know, there's some bald truths to be reckoned with. It's not under the surface. Right. And the upside of that is that I think there are things that the business community um, has to grapple with if they want to recruit people, if they want to um, locate uh, downtown, which increasingly they do, um, they need to be part of, uh, of that solution as well, and that's becoming a lot more self-evident. Uh, speaking about uh, examples, just to go back to uh, the D.C. region, the business community are paying, uh, they're paying close attention to what's happening in Northern Virginia, where in counties like Fairfax County and Loudoun County, um, there's a great deal of this, this investment happening after many years of those counties flourishing. They see, they're seeing that the more intentional, inclusive development policies of the inner core, like Arlington, Montgomery County, mm -hmm. um, D.C., some other parts of, of Maryland, you know, I wonder why Virginia would be slow on that. Probably the politics have something to do with that. They, they are seeing that effect. Mm -hmm. And now the business community is seeing all these vacancy rates yeah commercial, residential in those counties, they are scared of what is happening. And mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the outflow of people coming to the, closer to the, to the city. Mm -hmm. And so there is, uh, in speaking with some business leaders recently, they now want, you know, they're much more interested now taking a look at this inclusive development, inclusive economy approach as a more expanded region. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, they, they either will notice by, um, just looking at the effect of, of this or, or you know evidence will continue to help them understand what what this dynamic um, how this dynamic plays out but this is happening in real time in the DC region great that's really really an interesting um, observation I hadn't heard about that um, do we have time oh I guess we don't have time for any more questions um, but I really want to thank our panel um, for a very thoughtful um, and engaging discussion now you know why I feel so privileged to get to work with all of them um, on a fairly regular basis. But please join me in thanking them and all of you for coming.